because you're jumping back into the gap. All right, hey, go. coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is tremendous today to have Mike Neighbors with us. Uh, coach is coach. As you share and share and share some more, Coach, welcome to the podcast. Great to finally get on here. I've listened to many and uh, gotten lots of good nuggets. So happy we were able to connect during Took a major pandemic for us to have time to do it, but I'm glad we did. Yeah, however it happens, uh, we're grateful. And Mike is currently head coach at the University of Arkansas. He moved to Arkansas, your alma mater, in 2017 after four years as head coach at the University of Washington, where you had great success, including a Final Four appearance. And yeah, must be happy to be back in Arkansas, Coach. Good to be home. You know, I think that saying you can't go home is often mis- overu- is often misused. Uh, you certainly can if you've been gone long enough, maybe. So good to be home. Great to be back around family and friends and, you know, a place that I love so much. I went to school for for seven years, you know, so. <laughs> well, we'll skip that part on the podcast, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to explore what you have referred to as the curse of the clinic and something that I've thought about a, a lot. And I'm going to use you as an example yep. to, to bring this home for coaches. You play with set fast break positions for your players. And how that is super for you, and I've used that as well at the college level, but it's not necessarily good for development at youth level. It's not that I do, you know, what you do. Basically, I can't do what you do without deep critical analysis, can I? I don't think so, no, and I, nor should you. I think everything should be challenged and questioned and, and made into your own. And that curse that we talk about, we all – go to a clinic and we hear a successful coach who the, the organizers have brought in to speak uh, because of their success and, and we want to model those things. So, you know, sometimes those things should be challenged and made into what your own stuff is and, and absolutely not even true for every college team. I mean, there's obviously we didn't go undefeated this year, so there's a better way to do it. But you just got to do what's right for you. But that's that's where I think you come in, the place you're coming at it from you, you got to listen to all the good ideas. You go to the clinics, and, you know, there's two curses. I think there's the curse where you try to do everything, and then there's the curse where you just are dismissive of things, saying, well, I can't do that because of this. So you got to find that happy medium in between the two, and, you know, I think that's what makes this game great. There's so many different ways to coach it and so many different ways that your team can be successful doing it. Well, it's great. It it leads into something that we're going to talk about, which is a deeper dive into your whys. Even though you are a contrarian thinker, you don't do things just to be different, do you? No. In fact, I know it's easy to paint that picture that, oh, he's, if he says black, he says white. If he says go, you say stop. I'm not that way. And, And I know it's annoying. There's certain people that I know it bothers more than others, but it is, I do not do it simply to be contrary. I do it because I want everything to be challenged. Um, you know, I use my staff as an example. There's a lot of times we'll be sitting in this office and somebody will have a great idea and I may agree, but I may take the contrary side, the red team side to it, just to test how committed they are to their feelings and their thinkings behind it and how committed and convicted they are in what they're saying, how well researched it is. So I'm not just trying to be contrary, but I, I want to be right. And my greatest fear is that I'm doing something wrong. Chuck Klosterman wrote a great book about what if I'm wrong? And and that's always a fear. What if I'm doing something wrong? What if we're doing something wrong and it's hurting our kids? So I want it to be well thought out. I want it to be researched. I want it to be tested. I want it to be proven. I want there to be evidence of it. And when you go through those steps, then I think you can be confident in it. And then as a result of the confidence, you've got a chance to be believed. Not saying that every player believes in it always. But you stand a better chance because I am so convicted by it. I'm so convinced it's been researched. I will support it. I will defend it. And that's where it comes from. But you meet me for the first time and, or you sit around a couple of conversations, it'd be very easy to just say, he's just being contrary. He's a contrary and he's going to say opposite what I say just to start an argument. But that's certainly not the case when it comes to basketball things. Uh, maybe some of my conspiracy theories, 
uh, you're going to have a hard time talking me off of. But basketball things all have a why. Well, that's great. And let's get into some of your whys. Let's give us, give us one example of one of the whys that you are talking about now, especially in terms of sharing yeah. with people that I don't just make this up. This is why we do it. Well, I think this is the best one to do because it just kind of came out on uh, point guard Kyle PGC stuff and a little bit on Lacey Perkins coach summit. We did a, a, a piece on our functionally fast offense, which it's specifically named functionally fast because the two letters are FF, which mean final four in our world. So I wanted to find, find a, two words that meant the final four in, in, in abbreviation could be uh, that parallel, but also describe how I want us to play. I want us to play fast, but only if we're able to function. So within that, we specifically do not use the term one, two, three, four, five, or point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, post player to describe our players. We want, we use rackers, locks, rabbits, and dragons. And we number places on the floor, one, two, three, four, five, but we do not call players that. So a player comes into our, our recruiting database or into our system. And, you know, one of the common questions we get was, well, hey, coach, what, what position do you see me playing? Well, our response would be, we see you as a dragon. And you can imagine what their response probably is. It is. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> well, what's a dragon? So now I got them. Because I get to explain, we get to explain exactly what a dragon is. It's not an amalgam of the 25 coaches they've had and the 10 workout people they've worked with and the hundreds of commentators they've heard on TV say, oh, he's the consummate point guard. Oh, he's the prototypical two guard. They have no concept whatsoever. They don't know what a dragon is. They don't have any idea what a dragon is. So from day one, we're able to start setting the tone for the behaviors that we're going to teach, reward, and play for their four years here. So we got them. It, they become what we need them to be to play within our systems and our strategies and our tactics. And obviously the experiences they have are very valuable or we wouldn't be talking to them. But from day one, when I get a freshman racker, I get wide eyes, open ears, and they're learning. Now, they may digress every now and say, oh, so I'm the point guard. And that's when I meet this time say, I understand why you said that. I understand why you said you might be a point guard. But we're going to call you a racker because every time you touch the ball, I want you to think and take it to the rack. You know, our locks are people that run to that lock spot and get their feet set and get their hands locked and get their feet locked and get their eyes locked. It's, they're specifically used terms, the rabbit. She's got holes that she runs and hides in. She's got times that she sprints up out of there. She's got to have rabbit ears up to know when to, to set step up screens and drag screens and go cuts and all the things we ask her to do. Uh, you know, our dragon, uh, everybody wants to be the dragon because of Game of Thrones and they, think, they just think it sounds like cool. But they also get to be the last person across the court. They're dragging behind and the dragon is a, is a killer shooter. So we use those terms to – Obviously, first, say that we are positionless. We, we're not going to be like everybody else. Your definitions of one, two, three, four, five are different than what we're doing. So we get to explain the behaviors that we're looking for from day one all the way through. And it, it's amazing how quickly they pick up on it. It's always my coaches that struggle with it. The coaches that come in from new programs that have been coached in the same way for you know, 15 or 20 years, the players get it. And they, you won't hear the word point guard thrown around our practices hardly ever at all or shooting guard. They will refer to them in press conferences. It is, it's always classic when the first time one of my players is in a press conference and I, I just try to be the best racker I can be. And everybody looks at them like, what are they talking about? So, you know, that's the why there is a why to it. We're not just being contrary. There is a specific reason why. Well, and I'm going to dig a little deeper on that because, I mean, the brilliance to it, let's start with the first part, which is it's marketing, right? It's marketing. Like everybody remembers your stuff better because of these colorful words that yeah. you apply to what you do, right? Well, it's funny. You know, I've got a couple of, you know how it is, whenever the local college starts to run something, the neighboring high schools and youth programs taking on, well, a lot of people have started to, to mimic it. And I, I'll get a text every now and then, coach, 
we call ours the sniper and the trigger and the lion because we're the lions. It's amazing how, how people take it and run with it. And it just, you know, it does all of us around here, it does our hearts good to know that people are taking it, they're making it their own, they're making it successful in their way. But yeah, I, I do think there is a, a certain amount of it that again, if, if I ever hear anybody doing it, I, I know they've probably heard us because this is something that, to my knowledge, I'm not sure anybody had ever started to use before, but I borrowed it from football coaches. I've studied football coaches for the last 15 years and I kind of borrowed it from them. You know, they always had the Mike linebacker and the this and the that. And the, I just thought those were cool. So we've, we've made it into basketball. We've made it into ours. And I do think, as you mentioned, there is a little bit of marketing for us that that becomes a recruiting element as well. We're a little different and that's okay. Well, you've got to recruit. And that's, that's a part of it, as you said, with the, the, the ability to be able to attract someone to that word. But I'm going to add more to this because that's who I am too. And I know, I'm sure you've looked at this, but the evidence behind this from a remembering standpoint in terms of decoding storage and retrieval, there's evidence that using these colorful words helps. And mm-hmm. some of the areas it helps with is interest. Obviously, it provide, it, right away, the people you tell them these words to are interested because it's different, right? So it attracts their attention. And then the second part, which you do a great job of, is comprehension. Like you explain what they mean. So now the person is able to associate, visualize, which is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. And then within their brain, they're able to consolidate this because there's context. And it's just this really dynamic process that there's tons of research behind this. And I think it's tremendous. And whatever the words are you use, right? This is important to be able to give your players this context and this visualization and this dynamic remembering process. Yeah. And it, it comes to, you know, it becomes our language. We speak a different language. Our diet, we're speaking the same language, basketball language, but our dialect is just ours. You know, all the books you talked about when you read made to stick by Chip and Dan Heath. And when you read spark and you read all these things about the way the brain works, the teaching methods, it's all kind of that brought together to make sure that your words speak in images too. You know, my kids always get a, they always laugh. We have to, you know, I said, chin on shoulder. We always start. That's the way we defend the post chin on shoulder. Stop the film. Hey, is your chin on her shoulder? And it's easy to determine you look and her chin is usually in her back, you know, or under her arm. I, we want your chin on her shoulder. And if your chin is not on her shoulder, it's easy to, to see it's easy to correct, and it's a constant thing. We see kids fighting to get that the bottom of their chin on the point of an of a, of offensive player's shoulder. The one that my group, you know, when I, when I say crack to corner, you know, I mean a butt crack. Love it. Pointing to the corner, so, and, and it gets yeah. a giggle still to this day. But you know what? <laughs> they never forget it. They never forget it. But so those types of things, yes, they, they're, they're, they're easy to remember. They speak in images. They're visual. It, it attracts all your learning types. They, they see it. They hear it. They perceive it, they comprehend it, and then they can now go do it. They stand a better chance to go do it. If, if you say something as a coach that takes away from their focus, you know, we could spend an hour talking about focus, you know, research showing that if you distract a player who's engaged in something, it may take them five to seven seconds. If they're extremely focused kid, if, if I distract them during a live ball, they stand no chance of refocusing within the next five to seven seconds. It's just human nature. And the, the least focused of your kids, it may take up to 20 minutes to refocus. So think about how much you can screw a kid up trying to coach during a live ball. So all of that stuff goes together. I think it's all very intentional. And I think we have to be that way because our time with our players is so very limited. We can't waste any of those moments, any teachable moment, so we, we've got to be very intentional. We've got to be very specific. Uh, and we've got to be very consistent. And, and I think that's how you turn things around quick. The question always is, how can you turn a, a last place team into a team that's contending fast? And it's all little things like this. It's a, it's a bunch of incremental gains in, in small areas. So although it takes me and our coaches a long time to come up with these, we've got the time. It takes the kids no time to grasp it. And I think that's why our freshmen can come and be successful. I think it's why a transfer can come in here, a junior college, anybody can come in and be immediately comfortable to go out and play. And then you let them go play. And once they know what you're saying, you let them go play. 
Well, common language speeds up learning is what you're referring to, which is absolutely true. And then I want to come back to something you said in the middle of that, which is live ball coaching. Can you talk about that? Because I find that's one of the biggest problems for coaches is not understanding how not valuable that is. Yeah, and I did it. I, it's it's in one we've of all my. Done it. <laughs> yeah, we've all done it. I do an hour on twenty five signs that you suck as a coach. It's not your players' fault. It's your fault. And that one's really high up on the list. You know, coaches who you know, I say they're trying to cure cancer during a live ball. That's not the time to do it. And really, even during a timeout, it's not the time to do it. It is not the kid's lack of focus. It is not your inability. It is just the way our brains, to the point to which our brains have evolved. We're not to the point where we can handle all of those things and then be expected to go out onto a floor where you're required to make immediate split-second decisions constantly in this game. And when you live ball coach, if we're running up the floor on offense right after, you know, somebody gets, let's say they blow a ball screen assignment and we're transitioning from that, that made basket that we just gave up down to offense and I'm yelling at her about how she guarded the ball screen well, there's a 90% chance she's not going to execute the play we just called because I've got her distracted and I've got the brain focusing on that. And it's my fault that she makes the second mistake, not hers. So, you know, I I make sure that the coaching that we are doing is during dead balls. We we call that dead ball management. You know, that's when we can talk and we got to be very specific in how we even use that time. But we're not during a live ball trying to distract anybody. The only person I sometimes will distract is that racker of mine who I've got utmost confidence in as one of my focus kids, maybe to give her a play call, you know, a set play that we're trying to run. If there's a dead ball or, you know, we're coming up in transition, there's been a slow outlet pass and we're having to walk the ball up the floor. She's probably the only person I would ever say it. I'm not going to talk to any of those four other positions. I want them fully locked into what they're trying to get done. So You know, long story short, exactly what you said. Coaching during while that clock's ticking, if the kid makes a mistake, you better take responsibility for it. You better not blame them. Yeah, because that happened in practice. That mistake happened in practice, right? That's where all of our coaching takes place. But just to add a little bit again to the, the, the evidence behind it, when players play, I don't think coaches understand. They actually have a really narrow attentional focus. And when we communicate to them, it broadens it. And it actually helps them lose focus, which yeah, makes no, sense yeah, based on all the things you're saying. Yeah. That's right. You have, you have been you're, – you're being counterproductive to what you're hoping to accomplish. And, again, it's not the kid's fault. It has now become your fault. You're the one who should get taken out of the game, but we don't. And that's where I know as a young coach I made that mistake for a number of years, not a number of times, a number of years – So, you know, I think that's where experience comes in. And, again, if we want to get 1% better than somebody, we've got to do this 1% better or 5% better or how much ever percent we do this better than maybe our opponents. That might help us offset the fact that maybe they've got a better basketball team than we do because we do what we do better than what they do. And, you know, that's we stand a better chance of doing that. Uh, Again, that came from my inexperience when I – stepped into the Pac-12 and walked into the head coaches meeting and saw Tara Vandiver in there and Charlie Turner Thorne in there and Kelly Graves in there and Paul, you know, all these people that were in there, you know, and I'm looking around and I immediately flash back to my papa neighbors telling me that if you ever walk into a poker room and you can't spot the chump, that you're the chump. Well, that's how I felt, you know, walking into that head coaches meeting, like what can we possibly do to be different, to catch these people? And, some of the things are what these things we're talking about. Yeah, it's great stuff. And I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this for sure. And uh, before we get into the next why, which is why you practice the way you do, can you just give us a quick idea of how, of how you actually do practice before you discuss the why? Yeah, well, uh, there's two things I think we'll, we'll take off on it. One, um, first and foremost, we try to cut practice every Monday by five minutes from the previous Monday. Okay. So that, that is an overarching, my, my seniors know that my juniors know that my sophomores know that. And you can bet that they go and tell those freshmen that, that this first time we get together, the very first time we step on the floor as the team, I got a clock ticking. And however long that first week of practices averages out to be, 
that's our starting point, okay? So let's just use some round numbers. Let's say the first practice starts, takes two hours. Well, average that whole week, they average two hours. Next week, they need to be an hour and 55 minutes. The next week, if we do it, we go to an hour 50, we go to an hour 45, we go to an hour 30, and you get a chance to see a little bit of compounding effect here. That when we went, the year we went to the final four, we were practicing 35 minutes a day at the end of March. You know, as we were getting ready to head into the final four, we were on the floor less than 30 minutes a day. Because we had done the work every week leading up to that. And, and it, it became an unintended thing, but you would start to hear the upperclassmen saying, guys, we got to get this going. If today, we got to start today doing this, because if this practice lasts three hours, we stand no chance of getting this thing to 35 minutes four months from now. So that's the first thing. They know that. It is, it is, it, it's talked about. It is the thing freshmen hear about from our upperclassmen when they step on our campus because they want to get to that point, and they know they've earned it, and there's, there's lots of teaching points along the way in the middle. The second kind of prong that we're talking about the way we practice is we give our kids an additional day off than the NCA requires us. The NCA requires one day off during the season, during the championship segment of your season. We give a second additional day off. And when we first started this, a lot of my mentors, Gary Blair, Vic Schaefer, Kevin, all, everybody told them, said, you're going to get fired for doing this. People are going to think you're not working hard. But the what came out of it was we, get, we became a healthier, happier team. Our kids had more time to do individual skills. We still, practiced, we still did things. We just practiced one time a week. And that was on that Wednesday as we were getting ready to head into games. And we did other things basketball-wise. But the kids had an additional a day off. They had more time than ever. Uh, we got called into the compliance office because they thought we were doing our care logs wrong. We're only allowed 20 hours a day, a week. And we were only turning in 13 or 14 at times. So those are the two driving forces behind it. And we can stop and talk about those if you want to, and then before we get into any more of the details. But that's the two prongs that I think most people, again, think, oh, well, you're just trying to be a contrarian there. No, there's a, there's a why. Well, it's, it's a great why to contemplate because, again, workload management doesn't just apply to physical, especially if you're talking your level, right? It's right. all the mental things that go with being a student athlete as well that are a part of it. And sometimes we keep them as separate, but those things weigh on the athlete as much as the physical. Well, if not more, you know, I think you've had some people argue that more on the other side and, and the other, other intended things that we've started to see now, we've done this for seven years. We started that at Christmas of that first year and, you know, we just continued to do it. We did it initially because we had a bunch of kids that were hurt and we didn't have very many numbers. But I've got a full roster of 16 with a full practice squad of guys, and we still do this. So, you know, the benefits become this. They're happier off the court. They have better relationships with, that they're in. They're, they have more time to sleep. They have more time to do schoolwork. We don't have to necessarily do 6 a.m. workouts because we've got extra time. They feel like they've got more time to come back into the gym after study hall and shoot because – we haven't, we haven't just killed them during a four-hour workout because the NCAA says we can have them for four hours a day. You know, I, I, and, again, we got lucky. I get it that there's, you know, there's a lot of luck that involves, is involved in this game. We got really lucky in that we tried this with a, a group of kids that were freshmen when I started, and they were very talented, they were very committed, and it worked. If, if we don't go to the Final Four in 2016, Plum and Chantel and those kids' junior year, I might have had a different way of thinking. <laughs> but the fact that we did it with those guys, it worked. We continue to do it now with a variety of teams, and it continues to allow us. We've always peaked in March. It's seven straight years. Even the year that we were here that uh, we weren't so good. We only won three conference games my first, our first year here at Arkansas. And we, but we still won a game in the tournament. We played our best game of the year, our, our next to last game of the year. So that's pretty much been true all seven years. And as long as it keeps working, I can't help but think it's got something to do with the tactics and the way we, the strategies that we apply to it, because it's consistently worked for a variety of teams and a variety of leagues and variety of places in our development as a program. One team that was already pretty good and a team here that was on its way back up. So we're going to keep trying it. I'm sure that there's some things we can continue to do better. And that's why we're, 
constantly trying to do better. We're not there yet, but does continue to have some success. Yeah, it's it's great stuff and really happy. And we'll circle back to uh, I, I love talking about practice. Obviously, we'll circle back to that. But uh, maybe another why that I'm curious about and have never set team goals personally myself with my team either. But why don't you set team goals? Because we took a butt kicking in 2015 in Iowa in the NCAA tournament. We had I was a goal guy. Now, hey, I, I grew up around the goal setters. I mean, it was I knew how to keep them attainable, how to keep them measurable, how to make them stretched. I mean, I read everything there was. I was a big time goals kid growing up and stayed that way as a coach. And then in 2015, we had been to the NIT in 2014. We had a lot of kids coming back. Plum's getting ready to be a sophomore. Jazz Davis is getting ready to be a junior. You know, it's Leah Walton's going to be a junior. We got a good team coming back. We'd gone three rounds deep in the NIT. And I felt like we had a really good core coming back. So, you know, we walked into that room and before the year and we set some goals to, hey, we're going to the tournament. NCAA tournament, you know, or bust, whatever. We had, you know, we had T-shirts printed up. We had signs on lockers. We had cards in our wallets. We, you know, anywhere we could slap NCAA bound or something, you know, we slapped it. And, you know, lo and behold, we worked our tail off. And Selection Monday rolls around, and we get we see our name called, and everybody goes crazy, and everybody sticks a microphone in front of everybody's mouth, and they say, man, we're just so glad we got this. We've been working at this all year. Wow. And I looked at my assistants, and I said, we're getting ready to get our butt kicked. And we were the higher seed. Uh, we had a, a good first, but we did. We got our butt kicked. And it was on the way back from that trip, watching our reactions there you know there was the end of the year disappointment but man there wasn't anybody just hurt in their gut and I thought man that's not the way this is supposed to feel so it became my desire I always pick one word and I usually do it shortly after that year's final four to to really dive deeply into and study one year it was body language another year it was decision making another year it was you know shit all kinds of different ones, spying the line, all, all different things, simplicity one year. Well, that was the year I decided to, to study about goals. And one of the first books I came across was Josh Metcalf and Jamie Gilbert's book called Burn Your Goals. And when you read these guys' books, they've got several out now, Pound the Stone and uh, Carry Water. I mean, they've got some great parable books. But Burn Your Goals fell into my lap. And it was probably the most marked up note taking book I'd ever read because it was obviously spoke to me at the right time when I was looking at it. But they really challenge you that goals can limit you. And that's exactly what had just happened to us because we had had this goal all year long and everywhere we went, we heard it and saw it and wore it and worked toward it. And once we got it, we were done. It limited us to the first round of the NCAA tournament. When I will tell you, I think we had a team that had we beaten them, we would have had a good chance to go to the Sweet 16. So I kept studying and studying. I read everything I could get my hands on. and I got lucky enough to spend some time with Pete Carroll that year because we were in Seattle with his Win Forever group. And I just come, kept coming back to that these goals to me. And I researched, went back to my own life and realized that goals had limited me. And I wanted to be the best point guard in my hometown, and, and by, I was. So I got to be the starter for on our team. But that didn't help me when I had to run into the, the guy from Little Rock or the guy from Dallas or the guy from Kansas City or the, you know, the foreign exchange student from uh, Africa. So it was a lot of personal stuff pent up, and it came out that we were no longer going to set goals. So here we go back in with the, pretty much that exact team that we had just returned that had been to the NCAA tournament. We walk in the room and we say, all right, it's goal day, you know, and they go, all right, we're going to, we're, this year, we're going to, we're going to win a game at the tournament. And everybody goes, yeah. And, you know, and then Plum goes, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, 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 we're going to stretch it. Let's go to the sweet 16. Everybody goes, yeah, you know, everybody's fired up. And we're going to finish in the top half of the Pac-12. And we're going to do this and we're going to beat Washington State twice and, you know, come up with all these, what, what by standard would have been great goals, stretched, measurable you know, all that stuff. It would have checked every box for goal setting. I took him and I said, great job. And I, I literally wadded him up and threw him in a trash can and set him on fire. 
I don't recommend doing that on a public institution in a closed environment. You're going to get in some trouble with your fire marshal. So make sure you, um, that's probably the most trouble I ever got in doing that. But it set a very good visual in there. Like, what are you doing? I said, we're not going to, we're not going to use goals this year. I think those were all great, but we're going to instead, we're going to set some standards, standards that you are willing to hold each other accountable for ones that our coaching staff is willing to confront you with when you don't meet. And we're going to think of as many areas as we can around our program. And we're going to go on the retreat out to the Whidbey Island and we're going to sit around until we come up with a, what we're going to call evidence of excellence. And it all sounded like a great idea and we all did it. And we came up with 32 areas in which we set standards for. I'll give you an example. One of them was the plane rides. You know, I felt like we were terrible on planes. I didn't think we were always courteous to people at the ticket counter, to luggage back, to baggage handlers, to flight attendants, to stuff. So we, we said, hey, you know, you're supposed to, don't wear your headphones until we take off and land. You can put them on after that. Talk to the people besides you. Do things. We, we came up with all these behaviors that are, we use the above the line, below the line, Urban Meyer stuff. And we, we came up with these standards. Well, the kids really bought into it. And they, they held each other accountable. They held us coaches accountable. Uh, they made us wear we, – we couldn't wear any clothes they didn't have. I remember that being a huge thing in their, in their thoughts was, you know, we would come in wearing gear that we got to go recruiting that wasn't issued to the team. So they said, all right, coaches aren't going to wear anything. So we did that as coaches. There was a fine if you wore something that a player didn't have. But we lived it. I mean, we held each other, the players held each other accountable, coaches held coaches accountable, and vice versa, players to coaches, coaches to players. Never one time did we talk about going to the NCAA tournament, did we talk about winning a game, nothing. What's next? Uh, that's a good West Wing reference. We can get into West Wing later. But, hey, what's the next thing? What can we – what's the next standard? Well, as that season progressed, we obviously had a good team and we started winning some games maybe we shouldn't have. And the next thing you know, we get in the NCAA tournament, we win the first round game, and we're a seven seed, and we're at Maryland, who's the two seed at their home floor. ESPN had just said that they were maybe a two seed that actually could win the whole thing, the best two seed there was. And because we weren't goals driven, because we hadn't had a goal to win a game at the NCAA tournament, we went out and knocked them dead on their home floor, won by double digits, advanced to the Sweet 16, Get to the Sweet 16. Now we've got to face Kentucky in their home arena in the, to go to the Elite Eight. We knock them off in front of 7,000 people. There's still no talk about goals. It's what's next. Uh, and we're you now you're in the Elite Eight game. The next thing you know, you win that thing and you're in the Final Four. There is no chance, no way whatsoever, we go to the Final Four that year had we used goals. Because our goal would have been to go to the Sweet 16. And I'm telling you right now, there's no chance after we made it to the Sweet 16 that we would have survived that trip home, back to Lexington, and been able to win two games, having known that we had reached our goals. So that's a really long story to a short question, but that's why it happened. And then now that we've continued to do it, I'm more convinced than ever that there's not one scenario that I've ever heard of where properly set standards – could not have, at the very least, accomplished the exact same thing as a good set of goals could have accomplished. And you don't give yourself the chance to be limited. So you're eliminating that, plus you're able to achieve everything a good set of goals could have done. Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never-before-available access. Three all-access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all-access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force Weekend defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. 
Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. Well, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And the, the focus on uh, obviously daily improvements that lead towards future success is obviously that big yeah. part of it. And I assume that connects back to your practices as well in terms of that yep. process and these standards, right? It does. Yeah. And, you know, if anybody, if anybody's challenged by that, again, I'm not trying to change anybody, but just if you're looking for the story, the one of the most recent stories do that, go study in England, their Tour de France program. And Chris, you've probably read this. If you haven't, spent some time and do it. But how the non-cycling coach that was hired by, by the country to change their Tour de France program was able to do it to where the point they became one of the nations in the world. This guy was not even a cycling coach, but he did it through incremental gains. He did it through small improvements over a period of time that have large, long-lasting effects. And he's a, he's a standards guy as well, but their, their story is, is incredible. Yeah, no, I haven't read that. I'd love to check that out. I'd love to read that. Check it and, out. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Coach, why, why do you, I assume this is why do you like to be called coach? It came from a West Wing episode. There's a, an episode of the West Wing where the president is talking with some friends, but he's in the office that day and he asked them to refer to him as Mr. President. And that's when it really hit me. It's, it allows me to separate being a human being around these kids the rest of the time and to remind me that I got a job to do as well. You know, if I let them call me Mike or I let them call me, you know, you know, I, I let them get away with Coach Nabes every now and then, but there, there's always going to be a coach in front of it. And, and I have them refer to everybody on our staff as a coach, even if they're our video coordinator or our GAs or whatever. I, I want them referred to as coach because that is what separates us from the duty of our job and the, the responsibilities of our job. You know, I, I, my kids know, our kids know, that they're all going to be treated fairly, not necessarily equally. Uh, they know that they're all going to be given the same opportunities. They're all going to be uh, valued. They're all going to be essential, but not necessary. They're all going to be necessary, but not essential, but not necessary. They know that. And that being called coach is what allows that to happen on a daily basis. If they refer to me as Mike or neighbor or, you know, whatever, I think there's a chance for me to have some slippage there between the position that I've been charged with filling and their situations and their lives. And if, if we don't hear that, I, I think, I think there's just some opportunity for slippage to occur, not guaranteeing again, just because you're called coach, it doesn't mean that, that you're going to, you know, get the respect that you, you should get. I, I never can. I, I've got to go back and look this up, Chris. I never can remember to quote properly, but it's, this is not our saying. But, you know, leverage is the lowest form of leadership. And if, yep. if me being the coach, because I said so, because I said, because this, because that, that's, you can do it that way. You can certainly be a leader in that capacity. But it's the absolute lowest form. It's the easiest one to get by with. It requires the least effort on your part. So, uh, you know, I guess that's where that comes from. I, we, we want to be and need to be referred to as coach. I think there is a why to it. And it's not just uh, a power trip. It's not because we're trying to use our leverage. It's because we need them to know and we need to hear that be reinforced on a daily basis with each other. Well, th this connects with me at this level, which is there's these types of power that people have over other people. And one of the most traditional ways for coaches is this positional power that with your name comes power. But right. obviously as coaches, we want to move beyond that. We want to move beyond co coercive power, reward power, positional power, and get into what you're talking about, which is power based on our expertise, our knowledge, and referent power, which is this power based on uh, your strong interpersonal relationships. This could be where we categorize your, you know, just the, the whole compass of the program that you put together for your players. Yeah. And, you know, if any, any readers out there that haven't come across Carol Dweck and mindset, a lot of that comes from that, that background. That's the point where you meet each other and all the things you mentioned, that's what that is all about. It's about us 
getting to the point to where our position and their play meet and intersect to the point that we we bring value to each other. You know, there's you know every chance I, I get a chance to see Kelsey Plum, you know, I, I, there's not a moment that doesn't we we don't end without me thinking her because I know my career is not where without her. You know, Chantel Osahar is now in my office every day. I hired her as a, a first year assistant coach. Because I'm not in this position at my dream job if Chantel doesn't come to the University of Washington and stay for four years with a rookie head coach that made 418 mistakes that I kept catalog of my my first year. Most kids transfer, but she stayed. Um, she's done everything. I'm not the coach. At, I'm not the coach at my dream job without her. So we've got to get to that point to where we have value for each other uh, and we're respectful of that and we understand we can do it. Uh, but it does have to start out with them being a young person uh, and me getting older every year. These kids stay the same age. You know, the kids I coach stay the same age, and I keep getting a year older. So, you know, finding that way to, to reach that point, um, you know, the, the, least, the least intrusive way. You know, that's another thing we use around here. We, we try to correct with the least, the least intrusive correction methods. You know, we don't want to dole out a – a $5,000 fine to a $5 crime. So all of those things working together, but that's the ultimate goal that you talk about where there's that, com that connection uh, and, and shared values uh, for everybody that's, that works with you, that's in part of it and in place for you. Well, that's great. I love that. And just as an aside, if there's a coach that hasn't read Carol Dweck, <laughs> go like, go. Skip yeah, this it, podcast. Go like go. Yeah, I, hit pause. Hit pause incredible. and go. And hey, yeah. and get through it. I mean, it's listen. It's thick. It, and I, I don't mean thick as in number of pages. I mean, I had to look some words up, Chris. I don't know about you. I had. To, <laughs> I mean, it. It. She, it's got PhD at the end of it on the author for a reason. It is not a page turner. It is one again. Like I said, I had to look some words up, but it is. It is one that I think you know. Everybody always says. I rank everything. We're going to get, I don't know if we get to that in, in our talk today or not, but there's a reason we do that too. But I cannot rank books. I've been able to rank everything else pretty much in my life. But when it comes to books, you, you have to read everything and, and then figure out what works for you and what makes, you know, makes impact. So, but I would put Carol Dweck's book near the top of a timeline. I mean, I wish I'd have read it. I wish I'd have read that thing. Day one, like you said, stop the podcast right now. Yep. Stop, hit pause, come back to it, put a bookmark in it. It's technology. You can find it again later. Um, yep. Get to this book and, and, and put it to work and get a highlighter ready. Get a piece of paper out. Take some notes on it. Don't read it online. These people that, oh, I'm going to buy it on uh, fire. <laughs> now I'm not sure that's going to work out for you because you're going to want to highlight. You're going to want to write in the margins. Um, uh, you know, I know there's ways around doing that too, but. Yeah, no, it'll make you go back and search for more. And to me, I hit it at the perfect time. I hit it prior to me having kids. And I okay. can't tell you there's been anything more that shaped me as a parent yeah. than yeah. understanding that I should be rewarding effort over success and different simple things like that. And there's way yeah. more to it than that. But way more. Simple. Yeah. I mean, that'll lead you down to, you know, Joe Madden and celebrating small excess TED Talks and Axelrod Files. And there's there's just all kinds of places that that book will take you. But yeah, Love absolutely. It. It's it's the stuff you talk about. Well, Coach, since you mentioned it, let's get into the, the ranking. Uh, <laughs> why you rank? I want to be right. I want to tell the truth. That's the short answer. I want to tell the truth when I say "Sweet Child of Mine" is my favorite song of all time, and "Man in the Mirror" is number three, and "Emerald by Morning" is number four, and Prince is my favorite artist, and "Few Good Men" is my favorite movie, and "The West Wing" is my favorite TV show. And my favorite documentary is Sorry to Bother. It's not Tiger King. I can give you guys hundreds of documentaries better than the Tiger King. Maybe not more entertaining, but better. But I want to be telling the truth when we say things. The search for truth allows you to be trusted. It allows you to trust people. And when you trust people, you don't have to be perfect anymore. Otherwise, you do have to be. If you don't trust somebody, they got to be perfect in your life, and you probably have to be in their life. So you backtrack that to – I had a, a person, and I, I, she knows who she is. I don't call her by name because she's still a coach, but we shared a, a, an office, and she every song that came on the radio, she'd go, turn it up. That's my favorite song. I'd be like, no, it can't be. You said 
two songs ago was your favorite song and didn't realize for a number of years why it was so annoying. So I finally said, you know what, if I'm annoyed by this, I need to know what my favorite song is. So I started to write it down and this was 2001. So we're now going on almost 19 years ago. I started my first list of my top 10 songs and my top 10 movies and my top 10 TV shows. And then when you write that down and you put a number beside it, you put number one beside it, number two beside the next one, and there's an actual rank to it, you realize you got to come up with some criteria. So like for me with movies, it was if this movie was on TBS and this one was on TNT at the same time, which movie would I watch? And again, I'm not saying it's the greatest movie of all time. I'm telling you it's my favorite movie. So that's the filter I ran every, every one through. Every, then I would come up with another movie. Oh, I forgot about that one. Well, if it, which, which one does this fall between? Where does this fall in this list? And Chris, before you know it, that list was 200. It was 400. It was 800. It was 1,000. It was 2,500. And now it's up to almost 4,000 songs it's a it's a never ending list every time i hear a new song or am reminded of a song i forgot about i have a spreadsheet well i said actually a number sheet now sorry i don't mean to make mac upset by yeah. using the term excel to be all spreadsheets it's a number <laughs> sheet yeah. and i last not before last I, I heard a song that i hadn't heard in a long time by three dog night shambhala and it's a great song and I put that down as song number 16,393. And it's still a great song. And I've got 16,000 songs ranked. But that's still a great song. And I'm not even done. I mean, I know this list goes, who knows where this list is. But I know that that song is 16,393 now. And I know Sweet Child of Mine is still number one. And until something comes along that's really, really good and stands the test of time, it's probably not going to be changed. And I know Prince. Prince has been number one on my list since nine, since two thousand, really since nineteen eighty one, but I wrote a number beside it in two thousand and one, and it hasn't changed. Even when he died, even when they had a big Grammy ceremony for him the other night, I've had Prince as my number one guy since nineteen eighty one, and it's not changed. And I'm telling the truth. And when people say, "Well, Prince is mine," well, maybe he's not. Maybe it's my. Maybe it's this. Maybe Prince is my guy. He's number one. He has not been tested. He's you know, he's been tested, but he hadn't been challenged. He hadn't been beaten yet. In your so, world, yes. That's yeah. great. And, and uh, coach, I, coach, I gotta ask. Go. Because I got two questions here. Because this is in, incredible and impressive. How do you bring this into your coaching? How does this manifest into your coaching? This ability to be organized or to rank things? Well, I think my kids see it and they know when I say something, they know it too has been thought through. It's been run through a lens. It's been run through filter after filter. It's been, it's been talked about in our office among everybody on our staff. It's been red team. We don't just throw something out. We're not going to, I'm not going to see you post something on your internet on the, on their Twitter account of a great action that you saw the Spanish national team run in the 2016 FIBA games. Now, it may be great, indeed, but it won't go into our practice until I've talked to Chantel about it, until I've talked to Todd about it, until I've put our players I, – I won't – they know that. So there's some credibility with, that when we say something, and our kids know it, our kids know that every stat that I spew off – because here's the thing, and you know this as well as anybody. When you and I grew up – how old are you? I don't know how old you are. I am 47. Okay, so I'm 51, so we're about the same age. When me and yeah. you were growing up, you could lie to us. My coach lied to me for a number of years because he said Bob Cousy was the best ball handler of all time, and that was a lie because at that point in time, I didn't know who John Stockton was, and I didn't know who all these other – I didn't know who Steve Nash was. But he could lie to me because I didn't have the internet to prove him wrong. But you try to lie to a kid these days – if I go in and tell them that we're playing against somebody that averaged, you know, 22 points a game and it was only 20, you think I'm my credibility is shot immediately because yeah. they're going to go look it up and they can look it up. So we have to be right more so than ever. They don't need us for the information, but when we provide information, it's got to be truthful and it's got to be accurate. So 
I feel like because we do that in everything with basketball, if, if I'm going to rank my songs one through 16,393, then I've probably figured out why we're going to run twirl side 40% of the time. It, it's been thought about. It's been researched. It's been run through every scenario possible. And, and I think that flows over to our coaching. I think we're believable. And kids aren't going to believe in you and in your message until they believe in you. So I, I think it gives us some credibility. I don't think we have to be right all the time because, again, they trust that I'm trying to do the right thing, that my intentions are good, that we have thought about it, that we've talked about it as a staff, that we are all on the same page. You don't see me stand up and, you know, when my assistant coach who coaches our defense, when he stands up to change defense, you don't see my body language become oh god here we go and me sit down and slump over and cross my arms and see what happens and then when they score throw my arms up at him and yell at him you don't see that happen so that's how it all comes back I don't think there's one specific thing you can point toward but I think it's just the whole element of our program we want the truth and I want players to tell me the truth and sometimes they tell me my group has told me some things I didn't really want to hear you know I wish maybe hey maybe you told me too much there but that's great to me, that is where it all lies. And if, if I'm not constantly in search of the truth, if I'm that guy walking around going, oh, that's my favorite TV show. If they hear me say that to one person and I turn around and say that to somebody else, they could assume that I'm just trying to say what that person wants to hear. Correct? Totally. You know, that's exactly how that goes. Oh, that's my favorite song. Oh, that's my favorite movie. They could think I'm just saying that to appease that person. Instead, when they say that I'll say well why is that well what about this one here's what my you know here's where it falls off my list and here's why so that's where the lists have come to it initially started out because I was annoyed by a co-worker <laughs> but it has evolved into it now where I annoy people when I when a song comes on and I say oh that's my 83rd favorite song or songs are really tough but like movies I, I can get movies you know I've got 2,500 of them ranked I can get you pretty close especially in the top hundred, I can get you within two or three probably of where everything's right. Yeah. And I think to your point, it allows us to be credible. It allows us to tell the truth. Uh, and it, it allows for there to be some, they give me the benefit of the doubt sometimes, you know, I think maybe they don't make, when I say something, they may not even research it anymore. They may think, well, man, if coach is saying that, man, he must be right. We're going to go with coach on that. Um, yeah, it's such a great point, coach, and great connection to that, uh, to those two ideas. And I, it leads me to a, another question with all this, which is, I want to talk defense a little bit with you. And here's why, because it leads to you and you go your favorite song, Sweet Child of Mine. Well, if you're Guns N' Roses, you have to play Sweet Child of Mine all of the time, right? When you go to clinics, you yeah. got to play, yeah. your, you got to do your fast break, because that's yeah. your greatest hit, so to speak. Yeah. Well, what if your favorite song is Get in the Ring? Yeah. And your Guns N' Roses. You yeah. never get to play that song. So nope, I want to talk not. defense with you because you never yeah. get to talk about it. Great. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I go through the same thing, coach. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. I got to do my greatest hit. So yep, let's get into fine. some defense. Let's do it. You're functionally fast on offense. How do you describe and talk about defense? Oh, we try to do the exact opposite. You know, and, and people always scratch their head at me and they say, well, you know, shouldn't you be married? To, shouldn't your defense be married to your offense? And I, and I think that it is by doing the exact opposite. If we have sat here and studied as much film and as many things as we've studied and come up and said, okay, we feel like the best way to play offensively is to attack the basket and get layups, draw fouls to get to the free throw line, and then make three-point shots. That's one, two, three for us. Layups – get fouled, make a three. We're trying to get three points every time we get the ball, at least three points, maybe four if we get lucky or five. But we're trying that. That's our goal offensively. To me, our goal should be to do the exact opposite defensively. Don't give up layups. Do not let them get to the free throw line and then guard the arc. So – some people argue with me. They say, well, you should press and you should try to turn people over. No, 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 no. That's where I think, again, the misnomer happens. I don't care how many possessions we play. Everybody's like, well, that'll give you more possessions. Well, okay, fine. But that's not what we care about. We care about doing, the, doing what we think is the best thing we can do offensively as many times as we can do it. 
and then try to do the exact opposite on defense. So we sprint back in transition. We rebound with three, really two and a half. We send two back every time, and we send one back about halfway and trust her to decide whether she might be able to get an offensive rebound. But if not, err on the side of getting back. Because we don't want to give up half-court late. We do not want to give up a layup. And if we're back and we're set and the other two sprint back and we get in a stance, we stand a chance now to be able to defend without fouling. And then we want to take away the three-point line. Because, again, we have just said offensively the best way to play is this, so let's make them do the opposite. So our defense becomes that. Our defense becomes uh, a little maybe slower. Not, you know, but we're, we're trying to make somebody not functionally fast and uh, you know I, I, I get in arguments with people and I understand their point on their side but I've not been convinced that that's not what we shouldn't be trying to do love it and I, I love that thinking like I, I had a conversation in this podcast coming up to with John Patrick who coaches uh, pro- professionally in Europe and they are full court pressure but pack line in the half court yeah and it just speaks to the fact that you can coach anything as long as you believe in it and it yep. makes sense and it makes sense to your players. Sure. And how do you communicate this to your players? Because I imagine initially that's kind of messing with their heads a little bit in terms of the two differences. Well, I, I mean, I, I think we make it into a relationship type deal. We always say, hey, if, if these are the things that make you feel loved, you mentioned mindset. I, I would also add Gary Chapman's book, Five Languages of Love to anybody in there. Yep. These are the three things that make you feel loved, okay, when, when you're doing it. Well, shouldn't you try to find somebody that can give you those three things the most? You, you wouldn't want to do the opposite because this is what makes me feel good. So we put it in that context. This is what we're trying to do on offense, right? And, and you love this. Well, why don't we take that away from the other teams? And that's when you get that buy in that, hmm. This makes some sense. We and it also gives them the sense that, you know, we're kind of doing something that's thought through. It kind of makes them feel smart. Um, but again, it doesn't. It doesn't work if you can't ultimately end up beating some teams that group of kids never thought they could beat. And there's got to be some reward and some success with that. So. That's why I think you've got to be right in this. If you've got these great theories and you go out and it never works, then I think now you've opened yourself up um, to some, some, some question. But right now, it's kind of hard for people to, to argue what happens because, you know, two years in a row, we've gone into the SEC tournament, knocked off teams that were seeded and ranked considerably higher than us. We've beaten a number of ranked teams – over the last seven years, uh, the number of uh, upsets, double-digit upsets that our teams have been able to have, when they get that first one. At Washington, it was when we knocked off Stanford. We entered Stanford's 62-game road win streak in the Pac-12. They were number three in the country. We were unranked. We were 10-11 and 11 at the time. National TV. That was the game that we got that, oh, yeah, this works. Here, here at, Was- at Arkansas, it was last year in the SEC tournament. We knocked off South Carolina. That leads to this year where we knock off in, – in the same year we knock off Kentucky, Tennessee, LSU at home, uh, which has never happened uh, in the history of the program. So you've got to have some tangible success to go with the believability and the thinking. That's what gives you credibility, and it gives those kids that feeling when they walk in that they're going to they're gonna always be ready. We talk about shoot around. So when that's one thing other we do different. We do shoot arounds way different than everybody because we don't use shoot around to get ready. We, we should already be ready on that shoot around. Shoot arounds to get ready to play. We are ready. We are already ready. So if you stay ready, you don't ever have to get ready. I heard one of my, my seniors say that after she graduated, and I knew that our message had gotten through. She, somebody said, hey, are you ready for this? She goes, well, you don't have to get ready. You stay ready. And that was not that that word wasn't even in her orbit to use a word from my favorite guy, Prince. That phrase was not in her orbit before she came here to play for us. And now she's using it in in context uh, in dealing with the media and dealing with a job application, a job interview. So 
that's when you know these things become sticky. Your ideas are sticky. There is learning. There's context, and and they carry. Then there's carry over off the basketball floor into other areas of their life too. That's great, uh, Coach. Can you get into a little bit? What are some of the differences of your shoot around versus maybe what you traditionally used to do? Well, not everybody's there at the same time. You know, we don't have this set time for. Hey, it starts at two o'clock, and you better be there. It's you know, hey, this group comes at two. You may come in at two forty. You may come then. We may or may not all be together. We had we played 32 games this year, and I would tell you that we had 25 or 26 different ways we did shoot around. They're never the same. They are designed to specifically get us uh, best prepared to play that night. Sometimes we don't take them, Chris. Like if we if we play a game before, if we play a game that's going to require us to have a shoot around before 9 a.m., we don't even take it. We don't even go. We just yeah. we go to the gym a little bit early and do something there. We don't we I, I, we would rather be rested than ready, extra ready. You know, a lot of people get up and we always love it when we find out the team took a seven a.m. shoot around. You know, <laughs> that works for teams. I, I know Coach Schaefer has done it for years with Mississippi State, and they're almost impossible to beat. But for us, it's we play better on days that we didn't take shoot arounds. We started to notice that. When, Two or three of our best games we ever played, we, we weren't able to have, have a shoot-around for whatever reason. Uh, so when we do it, we, we do them a little different. They're, they're, they're different in format every time. They're different in people that are there. They're different in intensities. They're different in what we're – you know, the only thing that's consistent is we always do a little half-court shooting thing where we all line up across the half-court line. Everybody grabs the ball, and we try to machine gun one after the other, just half-court shot after half-court shot. You know, a lot of people shoot them until somebody makes one. We all we do it that way. So um, shoot arounds are different, you know, and that goes back to again, it's our way. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way, but our kids. You try to end a shoot around without doing machine gun, boy, they're hollering at you, coach, coach. We didn't do machine guns, so uh, <laughs> that's one way. Well, and it, it, it's it doesn't mean you're sacrificing anything either. That's the key part of that, right? You're still doing the scout. You're still doing. Yep you know, the player preparation, personnel, all that other stuff, but you're doing it before that. And I've always agreed with this philosophy because for me, I always felt like if I studied or crammed the night before a test, of course. then that would cause more problems with me than if I just went to bed and said, you know what, I'm ready. Yep. I'm good. Let's go. That's exactly right. And I think there's, I mean, there's evidence to that being, you know, true for the majority of people. So I, it, it basically initially started you know, as being an assistant coach for 14 years, I got to where I hated shoot arounds. I mean, I hated the routine of it. I, I'm like, you know what? When when I get to be in charge of this thing, man, we're going to do this completely different. And, again, not trying to be contrary, just, you know, 14 years worth of, man, the only reason we're doing this is because that's why somebody else did it. And that's how that person – or they saw somebody do it or they heard somebody talk about it. It's, it's ritual. It's not preparing them. And then – I used to, the other thing I started to notice, we would always play poorly on days that our coach got pissed off in the shooter rounds. So like, I <laughs> so stopped, true. You know what I mean? So oh, I, stopped yeah. doing, I stopped doing things that could potentially piss me off. So like, Hey, we're not going to do that. Cause that there's nothing that made me more upset. And then this too, we had a kid get hurt one time in the shoot around because you've always got this one kid on your team that shoot arounds their game time. You know, they're, they're getting to be the other team's best player, so they're playing loose, and they're, you know, they're going full speed. And your starter's walking through it kind of half speed because she's saving her legs, and they collide, and our starter gets the bone bruise. And I'm like, why do we do that? We didn't need to go through that. They knew what – we already knew what to do. So let's not, let's not make the coach mad. Let's, not, not make the, let's eliminate losing by not doing those things. So and I want to walk out – I want to walk into that – if, if we do a shoot around, I want to walk out, everybody happy, everybody whistling, music on, feeling good. Nobody's mad at anybody. Nobody's stressed. You know, we're not – they tell a lot of times we'll go to a away game and my, my travel coordinator will say, hey, coach, just so you know, the other team's going to be coming on right after us. So I end about 10 minutes early so that we're gone because I will never forget we're at Stanford, Tara Vandiver's group, they it was and she later went back and apologized for this but she had got told the wrong time that their shoot around would start well her team comes barging on the floor right in the middle of our shoot around and my kids were ready to fight like they were ready to fight like what are y'all doing and we played like crap that night played terrible 
from now on, hey, we just, hey coach, y'all take it. It's court y'all's. We're just we're 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 out of here. We're not even going to see y'all before we tip off. So I don't know. I mean, it may be, you know, it may be superstition. It may be a lot of other things rallied into that. But I can tell you, probably our top ten games that we've ever played, eight or nine of them were without a shoot around. So I mean, how much are they really worth? It's hard. It's hard to convince me that that was the reason that we've ever won a game when we nine or ten of our best performances ever have been without having won. Well, we can see why, again, it's long overdue to have you on the podcast. Um, I, I love contrarian thinking. And as you've <laughs> said repeatedly, repeatedly, this is what works for you. Yeah, sure. Through your experiences, through your analysis, through your tracking. Uh, and I know we didn't get into it, but I know you're big with analytics and different things that support what you're saying, too. And that's what's the most important part of this. This means something to you. Yeah, and I and I think that's it. That's the whole thing. And I, I I love having, you know, constructive disagreements with people. There there are lots of ways to win at this game. And and everybody that consistently does it, they are they are at this point. It is theirs. It is their way. They've got others surrounding them now that believe in it. Uh, and it filters down to their team. And then I think their teams go out and play this way. And and I think that's what's so beautiful about the game of basketball. There there is somebody sitting there listening right now that's going, you know what, I'm going to do the exact opposite because I'm a contrarian too, and I'm going to go win. And they're probably going to be able to. Um, But that's to me why we coach. You know, so this ultimately comes back to the why. This is why I love coaching. You know, I I think in business – you know, sometimes the, the awards go to the people that have the highest sales. And, and in this profession, I still don't believe that you have to win championships to be a champion player, coach, experience. You know, that's the why you do this job. You do this job because you get to make it and surround yourself with people that believe in and buy into what you're doing and make it theirs. And you give them ownership. And then you get to see those successes. You get to see that enjoyment out of it. You know, that's the why you keep coming back to this. There's no way I would do this job if you didn't get those invisible results and those small rewards coming back, um, you know, in the, in, the weirdest, in the weirdest ways, you know, a paycheck file. Every, every player that, of mine that ever becomes a coach, I send them a gift whenever they start their first job. I send them two folders, two plain folders, and at the top of one it says paychecks, and the other one says been there, done that two blank pieces of paper inside it. And then I, they'll call me and ask me what it means. And I explain to them that that's what they need to keep up with from, from that point on in their life. Places the game of basketball has taken them that they would have never gone without it. And, and mine is 20 now. It's going on 29 years old and it's old and raggedy, but I still have the exact folder I started with. Um, and then the other ones, those paychecks that you get, the, the thank you cards from a player five, six, 10 years after you coached them. I walked out of the house this morning. We're, we're having our, our kitchen redone because we had a flood. And the person that was there demoing my house for the last two days, long hair, ball cap, you know, just like you would picture a guy coming in to d- destroy your kitchen, says, did you teach chemistry back in Bentonville in 1994? And I said, I did. And he goes, I'm Brian Wilcott. And I said, you sat in the back row, two from the left. You sat with Jeremy Wiley and Allison Kuznia. And he looked at me like I was crazy. I walked upstairs, found his high school annual that I still had, brought it down and showed it to him. That's the why you do all this stuff. That's the why you keep that annual. I've had the, the Bentonville High School Tiger Annual from 1994 that I can honestly tell you I'm not sure I've cracked the spine of since I got it in 1994. But I knew where it was at in my, my attic. When he said that, I immediately was drawn back to where he sat, who he sat with, and we were able to have a 10- or 15-minute conversation about other people that were in that class. And, and that has nothing to do with my job at the University of Arkansas, but that's what fills your buckets, and that's what makes you want to be a teacher, a coach, because 20 was 94. That's six. That's 25 years ago. Is that good math? Almost 26 years ago the immediate memories that those things draw back. And I, and I think that's, that's the one thing that coaching allows us to do that maybe some other jobs don't have as, as reward. Tremendous. Coach, 
I can only hope that every coach that disagrees with something that you've said as openly shares their lessons and their experiences as you do. And I'm grateful for that. And on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for all the sharing that you do. Thanks for what you do. There's no question. I've, I've, I've learned more from you than you from me. So uh, I feel like if I could give back one or two nuggets, hopefully we've helped somebody along the way. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.